Chapter 28. Tin Man. Jim sat on the edge of the bed in his room. It was much like the room before he thought AZ was dead, back when he was still under the madman's thumb. The only change he made when he thought AZ was dead was to remove that awful painting of the psycho. He never should have relaxed until he had the very real-world skull of that bastard shiny and mounted on a stand. Much like killing a spider, you only relax after you've seen its mangled corpse. Anything less and you never know when it might still bite. There was a lot of what-if questions on Jim's mind. Top of the list is what if he trusted Mr. Carvel not to get angry that Nate was spying on the Syndicate network and telling him about the bloody eyes growing arsenal. It was a matter of Nate's life versus a paranoid fear. It seemed like the right call at the time. The clock in Jim's recently upgraded user interface said it had been just over an hour, but it felt like days. Not only was the ghost system offline, but so was any and all connection to the outside world. On the bright side, at least he wasn't dumped back into the black void. Nate fixed all of the neural encasements so they would at least maintain a basic white room, if nothing else. It was hard to think of bright sides with Sarah in the hands of that murderer. Jim was certain AZ wouldn't kill her. AZ was right. She was his Achilles heel. The perfect leash. He would do anything to protect her. Given half a chance, he'd certainly kill that monster to do so. Nate was also on his mind, although he was very optimistic about Nate's situation. If Nate was safe those minutes before AZ and Frankie entered the office, and both of those scumbags were on the run afterwards, that had to mean Nate was safe. And if Nate was safe, so too were all of the neural encasements. There was just one head boy that was in certain danger at this moment. Was it wrong for Jim to wish it was anyone else? They all seemed easily sacrificial compared to Sarah. It probably was wrong to think that. It didn't stop him from wishing, though. If he hadn't seen Sarah blink out of the office the second Frankie removed that box from the side of the case, he would have at least had the hope it was one of the others. It's not like you can see the person inside a brain case. And Jim knew for certain AZ wanted him to know it was really her. That's why he rigged up that wireless connection thing. It was all an elaborate demonstration for the sake of drama. He wanted Jim to know. Every chance that villain got, he went out of his way to crush Jim. He seemed to enjoy toying with Jim more than anything else in life. This was just the last in a long line of his mind games. AZ was irredeemably evil. That monster had to die. Jim stood up in fury and looked around the room for something to punish. He kicked over the table and then picked up a chair and threw it. Both bounced without the tiniest bit of damage. Of course they did, thought Jim. The simulation his case ran was basic. All he wanted to do was destroy something. Just a single object to suffer his impotent wrath. To quell the unrelenting rage and fear that was tearing his mind apart. But this lame simulation didn't support any of the physics for destruction. Jim screamed as loudly as he could. At least the sound hurt his ears. He needed something to suffer, even if it was just himself. No amount of damage can match the fear tearing apart his soul, and he couldn't do a damn thing trapped inside this white room. Suddenly, his useless user interface pinged with an incoming audio call. The rush of excitement pushed back the overwhelming fear. The call was from Nate. Jim pressed the answer button and almost screamed out, Thank God, Nate! The young and equally happy voice replied, Jim, you're okay. Just relax a bit. We almost dug you out. Did anyone stop AZ or Frankie? Where's Sarah? Demanded Jim, who certainly wasn't ready to relax. Not a single screaming thought in his mind could relax in that moment. AZ? He's alive? Said Nate in shock over the scratchy voice channel. There was a lot of noise in the background. There must have been several people working, as well as at least one large machine. Jim couldn't make out the gruff tones of Mr. Carvel among them, though. It was AZ and Frankie. They led the Bloody Eyes attack. They kidnapped Sarah. It was her case, I'm certain of it, said Jim. That's why I can't find her, replied Nate. I searched all over. I was so scared she was in your office at the time of the attack. Did they hurt her? No, I think they want to use her to control me. Where's Mr. Carvel? We need him out of rescue, said Jim over the background noise. Mr. Carvel's in the hospital. He was wounded in the attack. The whole place was shot up. But I think I might know someone even better, said Nate optimistically. You'll see him when we get you out of that safe box. You're going to love this. Jim couldn't even imagine what good news Nate could have that could possibly compare to the bad. Jim was about to ask him what he meant, but then his room flickered in and out of existence for a second, and the audio channel went dead. The user interface said all connections were offline again. Maybe it was because of the digging? Again, Jim was left to wonder and wait. Another 20 minutes passed, and Jim was in the middle of playing Furniture Jenga when another communication channel appeared. At the time, he was attempting to balance the mattress on the side of the table, which sat on the back of the chair. He dropped everything for the call, sending all three items crashing down. This time was a proper video window, like the floating screen he used to use all of the time. 
On the screen was Nate and some kind of tractor or something behind him. Whatever it was, it was too tall for the camera's view. Nate, there you are, said Jim, happy to see the kid again. The picture was grainy and harshly lit from a few nearby floodlights. In the background, a few men were cleaning up debris, while some others just appeared to be standing there, looking at something nearby Nate. They seemed awestruck. Sorry, Jim. I wired up a connection to the safe box through what was left of the ghost system, but when our friend pulled off the rest of the wall that fell, the wiring came with it, said Nate, motioning to the large machine behind him. Jim couldn't tell from the angle if Nate was talking into a tablet or a new camera on the outside of his case, whatever it was had a narrow viewing angle. The large machine behind Nate seemed to wobble, like its brakes weren't on. Nate, watch out for that tractor behind you. I think it's moving, warned Jim. Nate turned around and looked past the machine behind him and asked, Tractor? Where? Then the machine behind Nate appeared to slowly start falling, and a familiar voice said, I think he means me, Nate. Jim hadn't heard that voice in almost 20 years. It was... Matthew? As the machine descended, Nate stepped aside, and into frame dropped a thick metal arm with huge human-like fingers, each nearly as wide as Nate's wrist. The arm alone was larger than Nate's entire body. A huge spherical chest slid past the camera as it continued to descend into frame. Across his chest and arms were small gouges and burn marks, and finally a small domed head dropped into view. Nate disappeared to the right, and then the camera lifted up and started to pull back, finally revealing the full extent of the now kneeling machine. It was a pixelated giant man from before, only now sharply visible and more impressive than ever. What the hell is that? said Jim in shock. Now is that any way to talk to an old friend? answered the robot. Or really, should I say Matthew? It was definitely Matthew. How? What? Who? How? stammered Jim, unable to wrap his mind around both his long-lost friend finding him, as well as the monolithic machine he seemed to inhabit. Did you have a stroke? Come on, Jim, get with the program, joked Matthew. It's a military-grade body. You called us for help, remember? But how? Where? What? Again stammered Jim. He still couldn't wrap his mind around the eight-foot-tall monster. Nate laughed. Jim could see why a few of Mr. Carvel's men were just standing around awestruck. It's all pretty simple. You know those old military guys we used to game with? Well, they had connections. After everything went to and the country started to fall apart. They pulled some strings. Bada bing, bada boom. We got mech suits, said Matthew as he waved his hands around his chest. The U.S. military made battle suits for neuro encasements, asked Jim in shock. Yeah, Jim, get with the program. Don't you know who invented this technology to start with? Neural encasements didn't come from the civilian sector. It was U.S. military, all the way. Soldiers with replaceable bodies. Men made of steel. Come on, man. Didn't you ever look into where neural encasements came from? I thought everybody knew that, said Matthew. Jim had no idea what Matthew was talking about. But really, he didn't know much about the device that kept his brain alive. Knew you didn't seem to be military-related in the slightest. Jim always assumed they were a Silicon Valley startup or something. Some kind of mixture between video games and medical science. Nothing about it ever indicated anything military. As Robot Matthew waved his hands around, explaining the origins of neural encasements, the men behind him put their hands on their guns. Matthew's robotic body must have had eyes in the back of its head, though, as he immediately spun his head around like the exorcist, looked at the men and said, Come on, fellas. We've already done this before. You know bullets can't hurt me. But if you nick Nate over here or my friend Jim, I'm going to pull off your arms and legs like a fly. All of the men, carefully and quickly, took their hands off their collective guns and went back to staring in awe. Nate just laughed and said, All you tough guys just relax. Yeah, go on patrol or whatever you idiots get paid to do, said Matthew as he waved a robotic hand at them. The clearly terrified men backed away. A few wandered off, but several continued to stand where they were to observe. One of them appeared to be talking to the air. One reason it took so long to get you out was the big gunfight Mr. Carvel's men had when they saw your friend, said Nate. Well, it wasn't much of a gunfight. They just shot until they ran out of bullets. I got him to calm down, and then I walked over to Matt while they were all peeing themselves said Nate proudly. Ah, oh, this kid here, said Matthew as he took one of his large metal fingers and gently ruffled Nate's hair. Nate pushed off the huge metal finger with his much, much smaller hand. He walked right up to me like he owned the place. Talked to those grown-ups like little kids. They were being little kids. He was clearly just standing there in a hail of gunfire, waiting for them to stop throwing a hissy fit with their little guns, chimed in Nate. This is tank class armor. Their little pop guns can't do to me in here, proudly said Matthew as he pointed a metal thumb at his crazy, large, spherical chest. 
The ball structure must have been at least five feet wide, maybe six. Even the cluster of hand grenades did little more than gouge a few shallow divots out of it. Comparing it to a tank sounded about right. But how did you find me? Asked Jim as the crazy reality of the situation started to sink in. IP addresses, of course. There's only a handful of people who have full internet access now. It's pretty easy to figure out who's talking to who, replied Matthew. If only you could have sent us a message weeks ago. We could have crushed that gang Nate told me about and gotten you out in a jiffy. Speaking of which, where is everybody? I got a VTOL here ready for those hundred plus head boys you're talking about. Come on, Jim, it's time to go, said Matthew as he gestured up to the sky. It's complicated. I don't think everyone wants to go, but right now we have to save Sarah, demanded Jim. What do you mean everybody doesn't want to go? Who's Sarah? Jim just ignored Matthew's question for a far more pertinent one. Do you have another one of those suits? 